and service. I trust you'll receive a blessing as you study with us today. I've chosen for my sermon today the one way to salvation. And we all know there is only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. And this morning in the children's story, which Karen talks, even touched on the text that I'm using in the sermon today. And she didn't know because I didn't tell her. It says in Micah 5 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So it tells us in that text that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem in Judea. It also says in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, Jesus is the only way to salvation. There is no other way. And you know, Jesus came a couple of thousand years ago, was born as a babe in Bethlehem. And you know, today, bring a baby to church, Everyone wants to talk to the baby. If you're down the street, everyone sees the baby, they want to talk to the baby. The other night, on Thursday night, Olive and I were at a place, and complete strangers, and a young fella walked in with his baby, six, seven months old, and a couple of ladies sitting at a table said, oh, they didn't even know the chap. Oh, how old's your baby? What's your baby? You know, the baby. The baby was a draw card. Babies are such draw cards that even politicians love to nurse them. They even kiss them and all this sort of thing. What about royal babies? You know, Princess Mary of Denmark, when she was having babies, probably sold more glossy magazines than a lot of other things. Then Duchess Kate, and now we've got a new Duchess on the scene, Duchess Meghan, who flew halfway around the world just to have a baby shower. The media reports that it's cost $850,000. Well, did not, I don't know, but that's, that's the story in the media. So 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born, did everyone love a baby then? Turn with me to Matthew 2. Matthew 2. And we'll read verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and to come to worship him. Even though those wise men came to worship Jesus, that wasn't Herod's idea. That royal baby that would be so precious in today's world, this royal baby Jesus, Herod, was plotting to take his life. And you know, he is the only baby ever born that through whom we will receive salvation. And you know, what is salvation? If I say to you this morning, have you got salvation? What are you going to say to me? Some might say, oh, I don't know. Say yes, because the fact that Jesus died the fact that he rose from the grave, that gives us salvation. What we do with it, that's our choice. You know, when you come out the door this morning and you shake my hand, some little lady walks out and I say, have you got salvation? She says, oh, I'm not sure. You know, I belted my husband up last night. You know, I'm not sure. That's not the, what we want about salvation. Well, little Johnny, who stood in the grocer shop and the grocer man watched Johnny and Johnny stood on this side of the apple barrel and he stood on that side of the apple barrel and he stood here. And the storekeeper said, Johnny, you're not stealing or trying to steal my apples, are you? He said, no, sir, I'm not trying to steal your apples. I'm trying not to steal your apples. And then our friends today, we are like Johnny. The apple barrel is sin. And if we hang around that apple barrel, we will not have salvation. If there's something there that annoys you, go over there away from something there, go over there. Because I can assure you that whatever gets your attention will end up getting you. 
So if you hang around something that's keeping you from God, don't. Of course, as sure as sure that the thing that you get your attention will get you. You know, when Jesus was born, he split time. He was the time splitter. B.C., A.D. The only baby, the only person has ever caused that to happen. You know, statistics tell us, and it's a sad, sad statistic, if there's a hundred of us here this morning, if 20 years' time you took up the census again, not allowing for deaths or births or any other thing, 42% of those in our midst this morning will not be here in 20 years' time. So if there's a hundred here this morning, those are original hundred, there would only be 58. And that is a sad thing. That's only because we take our eyes off Jesus, our salvation. You know, it tells us in 2 Kings 22, 1 and 2 that young Josiah was the king and he came to rule. And you know, he, was, he must have had a good mentor, a mother or whoever she was, because Young Josiah was only eight years old when he started to rule, but he became a great king. And if you read through the kings in the Bible, you'll find that whenever there was a good king, Israel was blessed by God because they followed God. And we too will receive the same blessings if we follow after Jesus. You know, there's no other name given among men that we should be saved, only Jesus. And if we follow Jesus, we're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Turn with me this morning in Acts 12, 1 to 15. Acts 12, 1 to 15. A lot of you probably know this story, but we'll refresh anyway. It says in chapter 12 and verse 1, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And now the story goes on that Peter was in prison and Peter was going to receive the same fate as what James did. He was in prison tonight and tomorrow was his D-Day. Lucky for Peter, tomorrow never comes. There was a group of believers at um, Mary Mark's place. Mary was the mother of John Mark. And there was a group of believers, I like to call them non-believers, I'll tell you why in a minute. They gathered there together to pray for Peter's release. They were going to pray that Peter would be saved and his salvation would be made sure. And you know, we know the story, the bright light, the angel touched Peter he arose, the chains fell off him, and he walked away from his guards, through other guards who were sleeping, out through the prison gates. And when he went to the city gates, the city gates were always closed at night time. And he didn't have to open the gates. The angel of the Lord opened the gates. And Peter went into the city. And he knew that to go to the house of John Mark's mother. And when he went and he knocked on the door, and what happened? Young girl Rhoda ran out. She heard the noise. She ran out and she knew Peter's voice. He didn't say, I'm Peter, I'm here. But she knew Peter's voice. And she ran back to the group of praying believers and said, Peter's here. Oh, they said, you must be mad. Peter's in prison. You now, friends, they're here. They're praying for the release of Peter. But when he's released... They don't believe it. And then they said, oh, it must be his angel, it must be his spirit. When so often we ask God to answer our prayers. God always answers our prayers, whether we think so or whether we don't. It mightn't be the way we wanted them answered, but God will answer your prayers if you pray, and pray faithfully. And you know, the story goes on that, that Peter got away and the rest of it. This story, to me, has a reality because 
When I was a small boy growing up in Bowen, I used to attend the Presbyterian Church and on a Sunday morning we'd walk up from one end of town to the other to the Presbyterian Church, my brother and I, and there we would go to Sunday school. And there I learnt the stories of Peter and all these other Bible characters. Anyway, they, the, the Sunday school children put on a play for the rest of the church and I played the part of Peter. And we're in this hall and there was an area here and all the people sat there. And at a given moment, someone dropped in, someone on the floor and made a noise. Someone switched the lights on and off and that wasn't hard in the old days. Electric lights went on and off themselves a lot of times. And this noise and I burst out, chains falling off me in front of the people. And so this story has a special place. That's why I remember it so well. I haven't even got to read it. As soon as you say, Peter, in Acts 12, I remember it. You know, I just want to share a thought with you. And you can please yourself which way you believe this, but this is why I believe it. We have properties at Wallen, out west of here. And there was a property came on the market some years ago, four or five years ago. And I said, that's a nice property. We'll add that to these properties we already got, and we'll have a portfolio of properties in the Wyoming district. So I went and had a look, and I rang the bank manager up, and I said, I need some money. He said, yeah, how much? I said, oh, I don't know. My guess is one, two, one, three million. He said, I said, you ring Brisbane and make arrangements so the funds are there for when I go to the auction. He said, that's all right. He said, I can give you up to two million. He said, you, you just go ahead and buy the place. So... I thought I'd better show the bank manager. So the day before the auction, I took the bank manager out to this farm. We drove around, looked over it, and he was convinced it was a real good buy, and I thought it was a real good buy. So the next day we go to the auction, I want to take the bank manager with me, because when you do, the opposition think, oh, he's fair dinkum, he's got your bank manager with him, he's going to buy this. Anyway, he was busy, he couldn't make it. So I went to the auction, Sunday night, and we sat there in the second front seat. There's a lot of people in the room, and the auctioneer was a man I'd done business with in Mackay several years ago, and he had now had, he was only a young man then, he had his own business in Villa Wheeler. Anyway, the auction started, and I don't know, six or seven hundred thousand, eight hundred, nine hundred, you know how it goes. Then it got down to fifties and twenties and tens. Anyway, we are bidding along. It got to 1.2 million, and I put in a five, and someone has put a one. Anyway, I said to my son, it's just about at its limit. Anyway, cut a long story short, we sold to the opposition for 1.210 million or something like that. And anyway, I rang the bank man, he rang me next morning early. He said, did you buy that property? I said, no, I didn't. He said, how much to make? He said, 1.210 or something. He said, oh, he said, but you had $2 million to spend. I said, yes, I had $2 million to spend, but the property's not worth $2 million. And I thought then, well, you're the bank manager. You loan me the money. I'm the farmer. I've got to make that money pay. That's why he's the bank manager. I was the property manager. That's only half the story. I felt then that God didn't want me to have that block of land. I prayed about it, and there's no reason why I couldn't have got This was just a, some fly-by-nighter who bought this block. Anyway, I said to the bank manager, but unless that farmer has got a good plan, this property will be back on the market within two years. He said, how do you make that out? I said, unless he's got a plan, he will not make it pay. I said, we've got a plan. I said, we know where we're at and we know what we're going to do with it. So anyway, this man took over the land and in 18 months' time, he'd spent $300,000 on it and the property's back on the market. Aha, uh -huh. we'll buy it this time, and we'll buy it cheap because land price has dropped now, and we'll have all these improvements for free. It's good thinking. So we go along, the bank says, yes, money's right, go for your life, sir. The morning of the auction, I got a phone call from the auctioneer. He said, there is no auction today. He said, the land has been sold. I said, what? He said, it's been sold for 1.1 whatever million. I said, I would have paid 1.3 something such because the improvements are on it. Yes, he said, but this fellow panicked and he decided he'd sell it at the first offer that he got. So, friends, what I took from that was 
that I needed that block of land. God decided I didn't need the block of land. And I haven't got the block of land. Am I worried about it? No. I make mistakes every day. But the person I was praying to, to guide me into that block of land, never makes a mistake. Jesus is our salvation, and he thought, or he knew, that probably it was no good for me to have that piece of land. Well, that's the way I looked at it anyway. You know, I'd like you to turn with me to... No, no, no bother turning, I'll just talk about it. Uh, you know, Jonah was asked to go to Nineveh and to tell the people that in three days Nineveh will be destroyed. How would you like the job of going and saying to someone somewhere, in three days this whole town will be destroyed? Would you have the heart to do it? Unless you were in, really in tune with Jesus, you wouldn't. And Jonah wasn't, because he said, OK, God wants me to go there to Nineveh and tell them it's going to be destroyed in three days. But that's only if they don't repent. And Jonah said, Tarsus is over here. That looks a much better place to me. And so he boarded the boat, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story of Jonah because I've heard it a thousand times. I like it every time I hear it. And most people that tell it can tell it better than I can. So he got on the boat and he headed to Tarsus. And the boat got rough, and as we know, they, Jonah drew the short straw. And they threw Jonah overboard. Now, I don't know. You might like to think they threw him in feet first. I like to think they threw him in head first. Because God had prepared a fish to swallow Jonah. And when he hit the water, straight down the fish's belly. And there was Jonah for three days in the fish's belly. And you know, Jesus was three days in the tomb when he died for our sins. Anyway, Jonah's in the fish's stomach, and I believe head first down to the bottom. His arms are by his side, he can't move. He's physically restrained. His mental torture got to him after three days. What can he do? Nothing he could do. And you know, friends, the greatest part about the story of Jonah is what it says in Jonah 2.9, when Jonah and he, he came to his spiritual self and he said, salvation is of the Lord. And that's the moment that Jonah was saved. All that he could do was nothing he could do. But when he said, salvation is of the Lord, the fish spat him out on dry land. And the reason why I like to believe he went down the fish's belly head first, he spit out on the, on the dry land on his feet. Had it been feet first, he would have come out on his head. So that's, that's my theory. You know, it tells us in John 19 and verse 25, and I'd like you to go to John 19 and verse 25. And we know that at the foot of the cross is where we will find salvation. And then... In, his, in verse, no, John 19, 25, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, who was Mary, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. You know, there was three, three Marys there at the foot of the cross. You know, friends, we should daily come to the foot of the cross because that's the place where we will find salvation. You know... God tries us with, as, did, as it says in Revelation, that gold is fired to a really hot temperature and all the dross, all the rubbish rises to the surface and it's swept aside and out comes the pure gold. And that's what Jesus is doing in our life. He is firing us and preparing us for a place that he has. You know, David Livingston said, I will go anywhere as long as it's forward and anywhere as long as it's forward in Jesus. You know, we should look where we're going, not where we've been. Because if we look back, all the things of the past will, will get to us. You know, if we have salvation in Jesus, we won't just survive, we will thrive. And that's the difference. If our Christian life is all about salvation, about Jesus, 
we will thrive. You know, I'll just get you to... There is a story I'll share with you first. I went up the, up the farm a few months ago and there's a man I do business with. He buys my cows now and then. I hadn't talked to him for six or eight months, 12 months. I thought, I'll give Rob a ring. I've got some spare cows, it's dry. He might want to buy some. So I rang Rob up and I got the phone out and I dialed 0428, dit, 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 dit. And it wasn't long before a lady's voice came on the phone. I said, is that Rob's phone? No, no, she said. This is Mary or whoever she was. I said, oh, OK. Sorry about that. Of course, I'll be exchanging ideas and hung up. So, well, I'll watch what I do this time. So I'll dial a 0428 and dit, 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 dit. And that's what I did. Hello, you got me again, she said. Ah. I said, that's strange. I said, where are you? So I'm in Perth. Oh, I said, right, I said, where are you? I said, I'm in Brallabar, central Queensland, west of Rockhampton. Oh, OK, so we talked for a little while. She said, anyway, who were you looking for? I said, Rob B. I won't tell you the person's name. Rob B. And uh, she said, oh, yes, I get a few of his phone calls. His phone number is 0429. So I just called the wrong number by one digit. So when I dial 0429, dit, 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 dit. hello Rob. Hey mate, how you going? He knows my voice. And we conducted business right there and then, sold the cows. And but what I want to bring the story to you is that so often, so often when we're trying to talk to Jesus, we're just not in full sync with him. We just seem to not connect. We just dial the wrong number. You know, if we concentrate on Jesus and his salvation, we will dial the right number. You know, we have one way to salvation, but there are many different roads that lead. You and you and you and you. You might all be on a different road to me, but these roads lead to salvation. Now, I'll tell you why I believe that. When I leave my home at Barellabar and travel to Gracemere, I do that once a week, every week, sometimes twice a week. So I know every signboard, every bump, every hole, every creek, every bend, every twist. You can tell me where I am and I'll say, there's a rough piece here, and I know exactly, because I've travelled that road so often. And then when I leave Barellabar, I head to Gracemere. And when I go 59 k's, that's our farm there. 60 k's, that's our farm there. Go down the road a bit further, oh, that's the farm that I was going to buy, but God said, you don't need that farm. Then I get to the Lulu town off. Now I've got to make a decision. I'm coming down one road and there's three more roads. Do I go straight ahead to Gracemere? Do I turn left and go this way? It's much the same length of time, a little bit further in kilometres, but a straight road, good road. Or if I go right, I can go down to Billawheeler and down to Calliope and back up to Gracemere. But I'll still end up at the same place. Uh, now, you and I are on different roads. We're at different stages of our salvation. You know, it's certainly been said that this, this book is God's roadmap. And if you open this book, every page in this book tells a story. Any preacher worth his salt can pick up the Bible and whether it's page 1 or 50 or 80 or 600, you should be able to read that page and with a few supporting texts and a few illustrations make a sermon. Because this book has a sermon on every page. It tells us about the past. It tells us about the present. And it also foretells the future. As Jamie read out this morning in our scripture reading, certain things are going to happen before Jesus comes. We are on that road now. Things are closer than when we first believed. You know, I like the thought of Joshua who said, Choose ye this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you know, may our experience this week be like Jonah's. As we're in the depths of despair, if we're in a dark place, if things aren't going right, 
just let's think of Jonah and cry out, salvation is of the Lord. Shall we further praise God this morning with the use of hymn number 647. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. His truth is marching on. Hymn number 647.